to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 879 for July 12th, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. The uh, Mayflower was supposed to land in Virginia, I believe, but it landed in New England. And some people suggest it had to do with bad weather and and uh, needing to reach land. But it's also very possible that um, the Mayflower didn't have a designated driver. And they just missed. (laughs) It's not something high school teachers cover in American history classes, but whiskey has played a much larger role in the history of the United States than you might think. The very first tax levied by the United States 230 years ago was an excise tax on whiskey to help pay off the debt from the Revolutionary War. And that is just one example. Harris Cooper is an emeritus professor at Duke University, and he's also a bourbon lover. In fact, he has a certification from another university, the Executive Bourbon Steward Certificate from Moonshine University in Louisville. His new book, American History Through a Whiskey Glass, covers not only whiskey's role, but combines it with the influences of cooking and popular music. He'll join us later on Whiskey Cast in depth. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, behind the label, and... Running out of space again. Running out of space again. Um, just bit of deposit down another bit of land for some more distillery stuff. Um, so, yeah, we're always running out of space. I mean, is that a hot off the press Whiskey Cast exclusive someone? Is it? I guess so. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Hiya, Mark. How's my favourite Redbreast fan doing? (sighs) Look, I'm going to address the elephant in the room right away. We both know your podcast is dying for a co-host. And I know just the lad who can be the Robin to your Batman. How's that for dropping a hint? Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Hey, Gabriel Cartarella here from Dewar's Blended Scotch Whiskey. I'm excited to share with you that Dewar's is the most awarded blended scotch whiskey in the world. And that's worth raising a glass to. So grab a bottle today and enjoy this week's episode of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. And we'll start in Scotland, where Scotch Whiskey Association CEO Karen Betts announced on Friday that she'll be stepping down at the end of the year. She'll become the new chief executive of the London-based Food and Drink Federation, which represents the industry across the UK. Betts joined the SWA four years ago after serving for 16 years in the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, including stints as the British ambassador in Morocco and Mauritania, and with the British diplomatic delegations in Brussels and Washington. Betts is on leave and was not available for an interview. The search has begun for her successor. And a tip of the hat to the Spirits business, which first reported the move on Friday. Look for action out of London soon on the U.S. whiskey tariff. The British government's six-week consultation period on rebalancing its punitive tariffs targeting the U.S. has now ended. International Trade Secretary Liz Truss is heading to Washington for five days of meetings with U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai and other U.S. leaders. The tariffs on whiskey and other U.S. consumer goods were intended to punish the U.S. for the Trump administration's 2018 tariff on imported steel and aluminum. Truss acknowledged in May that the UK's tariffs need to be rebalanced to more precisely target the metals industry. The UK inherited the tariff scheme from the European Union, but now has the ability to set its own trade policy. The whiskey tariff also remains in effect in the 27 remaining EU member countries, but a scheduled doubling of that tariff is on hold while the EU and the Biden administration try to resolve their differences. While it is likely that the UK might end the whiskey tariff, that is not a given yet. 
Trade groups are still urging the British government to help the UK's struggling hospitality industry by ending the tariff. It's estimated that the whiskey tariff has cost UK whiskey importers about 55 million pounds since 2018. The UK's Wine and Spirits Trade Association also wants to make sure that that tariff does not spread to American wines. In a statement, the WSTA suggests that American wines account for about 10% of the UK wine market, and an expansion of the tariff could mean even more lost hospitality industry jobs. On the U.S. side, the Distilled Spirits Council reminded British leaders of Prime Minister Boris Johnson's election promise in his 2019 campaign to remove the whiskey tariff as soon as the U.K. was out of the European Union. Could Wales become the next big region for whiskey distillers? Penderin has been around for more than a decade and opened its second distillery in Wales earlier this year. Now the Spirits Business reports that another Welsh distillery is expected to open in September. The Mallows family's Hensel Castle Distillery will focus largely on contract distilling, but also plans to produce a bourbon-style whiskey, playing on the links between Wales and some of the American whiskey industry's pioneers. They claim both Jack Daniel and Evan Williams have ancestral ties to Wales, and their Charlie Perry's whiskey will be named for co-founder Reese Mallows' grandfather. While it'll be made just like a bourbon— Remember that international trade agreements only allow whiskeys made in the U.S. to be labeled as bourbons. Meanwhile, one of Scotland's smallest distilleries is in line for an expansion. Four years ago this month, Phil and Simon Thompson filled their first barrel of whiskey at the Thompson Brothers Distillery in Dornoch, right by the family's Dornoch Castle Hotel. They've already expanded once for warehouse space, and to create their own bottling hall for their independent bottlings under the Thompson Brothers label. But Simon and Phil told me on a Zoom call this weekend that they still need even more room. We're casually thinking about expansion, um, expanding production. I'm, we're nothing crazy. You know, we'd still be micro by... We'd still, we'd still be in like the, the bottom 10 by output capacity rather than being like the bottom one or yeah, two. But we really are desperate for space. I mean, one, whether we expand the distillery or not, we, have, we need space. We're desperate for space. We'll have more of my conversation with Phil and Simon Thompson next time around. They've only bottled one barrel of their own whiskey so far, with the bottles going to the Kickstarter donors who helped them fund the project. From a young whiskey company to a much older one now, 175 years ago this month, John Dewar opened his grocery and whiskey shop in Perth. That, of course, was the beginning of one of Scotch whiskey's iconic brands. Friday, Dewar's launched its celebratory 175 blend to mark the anniversary. And coincidentally, Dewar's master blender, Stephanie McLeod, was our guest that night on the Happy Hour Live webcast. We still really don't know how we're going to physically celebrate it amongst all our our colleagues in Scotland, but we thought we need to make a blend, you know, to celebrate it. And um, and what we did was that the date was the fifteenth of May, and and all the the malt whiskies and the grain whiskies um, were selected on the basis that they were filled into oak on the fifteenth of May. And that's from across our inventory. Um, And so we've come up with a a really beautiful blend, packed with fruit, um, packed with spiciness, and um, we're really pleased with it. And we've got this kind of um, retro style with it as well. So the the white tops, so we looked back in the archives um, to see what we were doing then, and, and we've kind of come up with a, a homage to 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 past labels and past blends. It's really exciting. 
The Doers 175 blend will only be available in the UK through the Doers website and the shop at Aberfeldy Distillery in Perthshire. It's priced at £75 a bottle. Of course, we do need to note that Doers is a sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Other new whiskies to mention, Torveg Distillery on Scotland's Isle of Skye will release its second single malt later this summer. Alt Glen is also part of the distillery's Legacy series, which will include the first four releases from Torveg. It'll be released in four separate batches through the end of next year. There's no word yet on pricing. On the European front, the Copenhagen Distillery is out with the second edition of its rare Danish single malt. It was aged in European oak casks that had first been seasoned with Pedro Jimenez sherry and then used to mature the distillery's oak gin for 18 months. It's bottled at 49% ABV and sells through the distillery's website for 3750 Danish kroner a bottle. That's about $600 at current exchange rates. Sweden's Gotland Whiskey has released the 10th edition of its Isle of Lime single malt. This one is named Sangelstein, after a mystical stone found on Gotland Island. The whiskey was matured in a variety of First Fill X bourbon, sherry, Hungarian oak, and virgin American oak casks for between four years and six years, ten months. It's available through Sweden's System Bolaget for 493 Swedish kroner. That's about $57 a bottle. India's Amrut has released a new Atma single cask bottling for the U.S. market. This one is an ex-bourbon barrel matured for seven years and bottled at 56.5% ABV. Just 150 bottles will be available. I received a sample the other day, and I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at the WhiskeyCast website. U.S.-based Impex Beverages has been busy, as the importer for Kilhoman, Penderin, M&H, and other whiskey brands, but is now expanding into the independent bottling business as well. The new Impex collection range includes single-cask scotch bottlings from Springbank, Kalila, Glen Elgin, Cameron Bridge, and an unnamed Orkney distillery, along with a 40-year-old blended scotch, a single malt from Israel's M&H distillery, and three different rums. They'll be available at whiskey shops in the U.S. On the bourbon front, Blue Run Spirits has released a new 14-year-old small batch bourbon blended by Bourbon Hall of Fame member Jim Rutledge. There are two versions, the regular version available at retailers in 10 U.S. states and Canada, and a reserve version that's the same whiskey, but will be available to people living elsewhere through the Blue Run Spirits website. Blue Run has also reached a new deal with Bardstown Bourbon Company to lay down its next batch of spirits this year, with Jim Rutledge overseeing the distillation. Last year, he did something similar for Blue Run at Kentucky's Castle and Key Distillery. And finally, no one would ever confuse a Bentley with a Tesla when it comes to sustainability, given that the luxury cars have never been known for being high mileage. However, Bentley has been working on that target, and it's now partnered with the Macallan, on a collaboration that combines luxury with sustainability and a goal of carbon neutrality. You might see part of that collaboration on the Macallan Estate in Scotland soon. The distillery will be adding two hybrid Bentleys to its fleet, presumably for VIP use only. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com, and don't forget to join us Fridays at 5 p.m. New York time for our Happy Hour live webcast each week. You can watch live on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events, brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. 
we do need to start with a couple of event updates and an apology for our friends in Australia. Whiskey Live Adelaide had been scheduled for last month, but the decision to reschedule it slipped by us. It has been rescheduled for the weekend of October 8th and 9th. While Whiskey Live in Brisbane had been scheduled to take place this coming weekend, it has now been postponed until November 5th and 6th. In addition, Edel Dropper 2021 in Stavanger, Norway, has now been rescheduled again from next month until September 25th. Things are getting better slowly, but we still have a long way left to go before the pandemic is over. Meanwhile, Ardbeg's Monsters of Smoke tour buses will be in the Detroit and Charlotte areas this week. This Saturday, the Virginia Spirits Roadshow hits Hampton, Virginia, and Sagamore Spirit Distillery hosts July's Whiskey on the Waterfront celebration in Baltimore, Maryland. The Kentucky Derby Museum in Louisville has a Bourbon Legends series dinner and tasting with Terry Bradshaw of Bradshaw Bourbon. Yes, football's Terry Bradshaw. It takes place on July 22nd. And there's a bit of competition in Louisville. The Fraser History Museum has its Bourbon Masters series event that same night. The Brandy Library in New York City has spirit school tastings featuring limited edition Scotch whiskeys on the 24th and Japanese whiskeys on the 27th. And McTeers has its next auction of rare whiskeys coming up on July 30th in Glasgow, Scotland. Right now, we have 162 live and virtual events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. The calendar is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of the Virginia Rye Whiskey. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, three continents, and online. Visit the Where to Buy page at catoctincreekdistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. After 175 years, Dewar's has learned it's not all about awards. Staying Curious happened to help us fill that trophy case with more than just our amateur fishing, golf, and bowling trophies. It takes time and commitment to make some of the world's most awarded whiskey, which is why every Dewar's whiskey goes through a secondary resting period for a more balanced blend with extra smoothness. From our first master blender, A.J. Cameron, to our current Stephanie McLeod, we've honed our double aging process to make some of the world's best Scotch whiskeys. Dewar's 12 Year, for example, was just awarded the double gold at this year's World Spirits Competition in San Francisco. And Dewar's 27 Year took home best blended Scotch whiskey 16 years or older. No need to take our word for it. Pick up one of these great whiskeys today. Your palate won't be disappointed. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. If you read between the lines of today's history textbooks, you might find obscure references to whiskey. You might read about the 1794 Whiskey Rebellion in the U.S. as a protest against taxes. But you will probably not read that just a few years later, President George Washington went on to become one of the country's biggest distillers, or that at least two of his successors also owned whiskey distilleries. That's just one example, and there are many others, not just in American history, but the histories of Europe, Canada, and many other countries. Harris Cooper looked at the convergence of whiskey, food, and popular music and their collective impact on American history in his new book, American History Through a Whiskey Glass. He is an emeritus professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke University, as well as a bourbon lover, and we spent some time talking this week. First of all, tell me about your own experiences with bourbon, because uh, I know a lot of university professors, and I know a lot of executive bourbon stewards, but I know very few that are both. Well, uh, thank you. My experience with bourbon really starts out 
um, as an accident. Uh, we have a home in Colorado, and one summer we decided we were going to uh, visit the Colorado wine country. And we went into a major liquor store, and we were looking for the Colorado wines, and we found somebody, and we said, we're going to the Colorado wine country. Where should we go? And there was a pause, and uh, the gentleman said, uh, you should go to California. And we said, okay. And he said, come with me. And we went over, and he showed us the Colorado whiskeys, bourbons, rye, etc. And we uh, said, okay, well, maybe that's what we'll do. We pulled in something off the shelf. And then we were in a local establishment. Um, actually, um, the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park. And we were looking, they had about uh, 1,200 uh, different whiskey labels. And we started talking with the guy who was behind the bar. He pulled the same bottle off. And we said, okay, maybe this is what we want to do. And we went and uh, visited that particular distillery and a couple of others on our way um, to the Western Slope in Colorado. And uh, that's really how it all started. We like to think of of the uh, restaurant, the bar at the Stanley Hotel is my classroom. Uh, the guy who was behind the bar became a friend. He was actually the bar manager. Uh, taught me a lot. Uh, but that's essentially how it started. And then it goes on from there to write a book. Yes, it goes on. What happened um, is, and actually, you know, for folks who are curious, um, the, our Facebook page, the the uh, the book's Facebook page actually contains the origin story. And it starts out uh, as I just started out and um, uh, takes you right up to the day the book was published. Um, I think there are probably about 60 paragraph posts there that tell the whole story. Um, once we got into it, uh, we started to uh, attend uh, whiskey tastings and uh, some of them were phenomenal. Um, and some of them were absolutely awful. Uh, the glasses were the wrong glasses. The host was reading notes off of um, uh, index cards. And I turned to uh, my wife, Beth, and I said, you know, I could do a better job of this. We could do a better job of this. This is adult education. And she said, let's do it. Uh, so we started to think about how to put together whiskey dinners for friends. And um, the most important aspect of it actually was that most of the whiskey dinners we went to um, were done by distributors. Um, and that's obviously the case. So they're sort of confined to um, using uh, labels from a particular distillery. Um, we didn't have that constraint. And it just came to me that my interest in American history and my interest in whiskey could actually be combined. And then I could take whiskeys from different distilleries to represent different eras of American history. I was reading books at that time about whiskey history as well. So it all just really fit together. Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, we thought about how are we going to pair the whiskeys with foods. I have a brother-in-law who is a, a foodie and a amateur chef. And he said, well, if you ever want to do it, you know, let's get together and we'll get some friends together and I'll cook some stuff up. And essentially, that's how it happened. I worked up some notes and he worked up some dishes and we tried to match the dishes with the eras of American history. And that was the very first time we did one. We ended up doing about eight or 10 of them. Uh, some of them were just in our friends' homes. Uh, we actually did uh, one in a cooking school, one in a country club, and one in a restaurant. And then after that, I said, you know, I've got these notes and 
and writing is something I enjoy doing. Uh, so maybe what I'll try and do is just give this whole idea away and create a how-to manual. And sometimes you might think of it as a textbook uh, for people to use to get together with friends. You can do it by yourself as well. Um, distribute some of the eras amongst yourselves and um, have a damn good time uh, tasting some good whiskeys, great whiskeys, eating period-based recipes, listening to period-based music, and uh, maybe learning something along the way. The history of whiskey really meshes well with American history in general, pretty much from the arrival of the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock, right? Absolutely. They, uh, uh, they, the, the Mayflower had more alcohol on it than it had water. And there was a good reason for that. There was a health reason for it. The alcohol uh, kept better. But one of my very first hypotheses as an amateur historian was that, you know, the a Mayflower was supposed to land in Virginia, I believe, but it landed in New England. And some people suggest it had to do with bad weather and and uh, needing to reach land. But it's also very possible that um, the Mayflower didn't have a designated driver. And they just missed. <laughs> That's obviously a facetious comment, but yeah, of course, that sort of sets the tone for the book. Uh, quite early. I noticed in your uh, descriptions of the recipes, you left out uh, some of the traditional historical food sources like uh, raccoons and squirrels and things like that. I did that on purpose. Yes. Um, I, you, you, as soon as you say you left something out, you know, that's one of the things about the book that I really hope engages people. Um, because folks can look at it and say, you know, uh, Cooper left this out. And how did he make that choice rather than this choice? And it's perfectly uh, reasonable. And I encourage people to modify what I wrote, to argue with what I wrote, to get angry with me because of what I wrote, and to just have a good time with friends uh, discussing what's missing, what I got right, uh, what I got wrong, um, and just engage with history, um, especially, and I think this comes across, um, hopefully comes across very well. I, I think that the people who, who wrote for the back cover understood this, is that it's, it's a different kind of history. I'm not a historian by trade, nor do I play one on television. So I accept that level of uh, guilt. But it's also meant to actually construct history from the point of view of the lifestyles that common Americans lived uh, during different eras of our country's growth. So have you already figured out uh, where you messed up? Absolutely, but I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you if I did. You want us to find it in the book, right? right. I, I want you to. I want you to argue with me. I, I already. I already have. As I've gone through it, um, you know, the process of publication takes years. So um, there are uh, places where I look and I will say, "Oh, you know, I could have really done better. I've learned something." Since then, and there is a, there is a better choice for this. Um, my older brother, um, who uh, is a big music fan, uh, chastises me for uh, choosing uh, Reese Witherspoon to sing Wildflowers. And I explained to him why I did that. Um, there are some brands of whiskeys that have come out that I wish would have been uh, available to me. Um, at the time that I wrote the book, there aren't many of them. And I don't think you, many of my choices are indefensible, uh, but it's perfectly fine for people to make substitutions and to uh, yell at me uh, long distance or even short distance, but to yell um, if they think that I could have done better somewhere. And to be fair, 
a lot of this history is conjecture at best. None of it was really written down back in the day. And as you correctly quote Chuck Cowdery, one of the best elements of marketing a whiskey is having a great story, whether it's true or not. Absolutely. So would you like to hear my, my, um, uh, my imitation of, of uh, Abraham Lincoln? Sure, go for it. Sure. Four score and seven years ago. Now it's up to you to decide how close I got. I don't believe there is any recording of what Abraham Lincoln sounded like. And that can be true with whiskey recipes as well. There are some that people have done a very good job of trying to recreate what it tasted like. For example, George Washington's whiskeys uh, now are produced at Mount Vernon in a reproduced distillery uh, using his uh, mash bill. Uh, they have tried their hardest and the same, they use no, no uh, modern technology. They are trying their hardest to reproduce it exactly the way it tasted, but nobody knows for sure at the time uh, that George Washington opened his distillery. There are others that may simply be, I'm going to put this on the label, and we have an ancestor who would have, who was the originator. We may have some idea about what the mash bill taste, tasted like or included, and it wouldn't, uh, there's, there's no way to tell. It would be very hard to uh, say how authentic that is, as well as the way it's to, hard to say that my, um, uh, that my imitation of Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address was not accurate. So throughout the book, you will find these kinds of, of differences. Some are absolutely right there. And obviously, by the time you get to the 1950s, um, they're going to uh, taste a lot like they did in the 50s, though they've probably changed. And then uh, in other places, it's a lot of guesswork, but somebody has made the claim that this is what it would have tasted like um, based upon the information that we have as close as we can get. Let's go through one of those episodes of history. Since, uh -oh. uh, this month. Uh, this is July an open book I, test? Well, it's the... Uh, 230th anniversary this year of the start of the Whiskey Rebellion. Correct. And since they're holding the Whiskey Rebellion Festival in Washington, Pennsylvania this weekend, it makes sense to uh, discuss that because we know most of the history behind it. And it really was the first major protest and the first real challenge that the new United States faced internally. That's correct. George... Uh, attempted to, one of the things that it actually did for him was it allowed him to try and raise an army, uh, something that the United States had not yet done. He didn't know how many people were going to show up to go off to the wilderness of western Pennsylvania. And uh, he got, I think it was between thirteen and 15,000 people showed up. About 13, yeah, from what the uh, historians say, mm -hmm. which was actually larger than any army he commanded during the revolution. Uh, uh, yes, it was. He, he, uh, um, I think he left the expedition before it actually got terribly close to the rebels, um, turned over the, the uh, command uh, to um, – what was his name? Uh, 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 Henry Lee? I'm trying to think of it. Uh, yeah, I think it was Henry Lee. Yes, and the, who was the father or grandfather of Robert E. Lee. Uh, and there really wasn't a whole lot of fighting that actually went on. Um, and that's another thing that I, I don't know what historians might say, but the rebels sort of gave up before they were ever... Uh, ever truly encountered in battle um, the forces of the United States. 
And most of them eventually were pardoned, if I remember correctly. Yes, I think there were two that actually went to jail, but that's about it. Um, And then they were pardoned. Uh, Washington pardoned them all. But uh, we have Alexander Hamilton to blame for all this, and they don't cover that part in the musical, do they? No, they don't. I don't know. I don't remember. There's a lot of whiskey talk in the musical. First excise tax. And it was Hamilton who wanted to pay off the debts of the federal government and the states. And that was one of the ways that he would do it. There was no income tax. There was hardly any other way to get people to pay money to the government than through excise taxes. And whiskey was a obvious choice. And the whole argument about taxes and whiskey has long played uh, a key role in our society. It was uh, the loss of taxes and tax revenue from prohibition that uh, a lot of people blame for the Great Depression in some ways and for ending prohibition when the government needed money. Absolutely. It was They had passed the income tax, uh, but when People had no income. There was no tax to collect. What do we learn from history, or what should we learn from this history to guide us going forward? Uh, That's a good question. I think one of the things that we have to learn is that when it comes to the regulation of alcohol, uh, that the best thing we can do for people is to uh, make sure they understand its effects, uh, in particular, its effects on them, and that the notion of prohibition um, it has probably um, uh, seen its better days. Uh, I don't think we're going to see anything like that happening ever again. And, you know, if you think about the history of whiskey and, and alcohol consumption, beer, uh, wine, whatever, um, it it goes back as far as as human history can take us, and it's not going to go away. The most important thing to learn and the lesson to learn, um, I hope it's one of the lessons that's learned from this book, because we do, I do talk about uh, people who um, obviously benefited uh, from their um, uh, encounters with alcohol, but there are also lots of people who don't. And everything in moderation is something that we really ought to teach. I can't let you go without uh, bringing up your other profession, Uh neuroscience, because uh, a couple of weeks ago I talked with Edward Slingerland, who just wrote the uh, book Drunk. Drunk. And he looks at the impact of alcohol on the prefrontal cortex and why we genetically have this predisposition to drink, despite the fact that we know it's bad for us. What does neuroscience tell us about all of this? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a neuroscientist by trade. I'm a social psychologist. And I think that's pretty evident in the way the, the book is written. Uh, my interest is on the person as a whole and their interactions with other people. Uh, but there are disinhibitions um, everything we think about when we think about the positive aspects of alcohol um, have to have some root in its impact on our brain. Um, and that will involve a disinhibition. And um, a, a trained neuroscientist could tell you what aspects of the brain are inhibited and what aspects um, are enhanced uh, when People are under the influence of alcohol. Uh, But I think most of what we think about as the positives of alcohol uh, deal with uh, camaraderie and they deal with um, uh, a a diminution of pain. Uh, And those will have its roots in different aspects of the brain and how uh, the brain activity gets fired up. Or inhibited. And we'll leave it at that. Uh, what was the last uh, bourbon you had that inhibited your brain functions? Oh, goodness me. Let's see. Um, I suppose the, la- well, the last I had 
uh, was actually a Colorado. Um, we just went to Denver, had dinner in Denver, and it's my practice. I'm sure this is true of many whiskey drinkers, is that when I'm out drinking, I never drink anything that's on my shelf at home, but that I know I like. And it was an A.D. Laws multigrain whiskey, which is a, a local uh, distillery smack in the middle of Denver. That's the last whiskey I tasted. And we know that distillery well. Yes. Harris Cooper's new book is American History Through a Whiskey Glass, and it's available now. If you can't find it at your local independent bookseller, we've included an Amazon link in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard. Oban Single Malt Scotch Whiskey is offering the chance to immerse yourself in Oban and the whiskey-making process through the Oban Abode experience. Two winners will receive a trip to Scotland to stay in the Oban Abode. It's located just steps from the distillery. To learn more and enter, visit obenabode.obenwhiskey.com. Complete rules are available at the website. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start off with a new release from Latitude Beverage. Hunt and Gather, lot number two, is a 15-year-old Canadian whiskey from an undisclosed distillery, it's bottled at 60.5% ABV. The nose has touches of baking spices, toasted vanilla, caramel, and dark chocolate. The taste has a good balance and intensity with clove, allspice, caramel, oak, toasted marshmallows, and just a touch of dark chocolate. Adding some water brings down the intensity of the spices while lamping up the chocolate and caramel notes. The finish, long and spicy, with a hint of caramel in the background. I'm scoring Hunt and Gather, lot number two, Canadian whiskey, a 92. But that is not the strongest whiskey of the week. Let's move on to the second Booker's Bourbon release of 2021. The Tag Along Batch gets its name from the history of Booker Noah's a child, tagging along with his grandfather, Colonel Jim Beam, around the distillery. Booker's son Fred followed along with Booker later on, and Fred's son Freddie has done the same since he was a kid. This one is bottled at 53.95% ABV, but there is no alcohol burn on the nose. It's sweet with just a hint of spice, and touches of brown sugar, caramel candy, vanilla, and chocolate fudge. The taste is peppery, as usual, with a strong bite of black pepper, chili powder, and allspice. While a touch of cinnamon comes out as the other spices start to fade, along with hints of caramel apples and chocolate. Adding a few drops of water to this one slows down the fading of the spices, while amping up the fruity character in the background. The finish, long and spicy, with a good balance and just a hint of oak. I'm scoring batch 2021-02 of Booker's Bourbon, the tag-along batch, a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. They're reviving the tradition of Maryland-style rye at their Baltimore farm and waterfront distillery. Their tequila cask-finished rye just received a gold medal in the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It's rye whiskey finished in extra Añejo tequila barrels with notes of agave and vanilla, dried fig and honey, ideal for palomas and margaritas. In-person tastings are available once again at the distillery in Baltimore, but you'll also find a variety of virtual tours, tastings, and other experiences at the Sagamore Spirit website. And WhiskeyCast listeners can get a free virtual guided tasting. Purchase bottles at your local retailer, and a Sagamore Spirit teammate will guide you through each product. 
Visit sagamorespirit.com and use the code WHISKEYCAST, all one word, to access. Please drink responsibly. This weekend I was honored to take part in an online tasting for the Water of Life Festival's charity event, led by our good friend Dr. Matt Luren. The theme was Fish Off, and the whiskeys included this year's festival bottlings for the virtual versions of Fagiel on Isla and the Campbellton Maltz Festival. Springbank's festival bottling was an eight-year-old Pedro Jimenez finish. It spent two years in PX casks, following six years in refill bourbon barrels, and was bottled at 56.5% ABV. The nose is dry with subtle hints of dried fruits and figs, along with plums, honey, and vanilla. The taste is fruity and vibrant, though. It has touches of orange peel, papaya, and mango, toasted coconut, honey, and caramel candy sweetness. The finish is long, fruity, and sweet, with just a touch of spice. It's a stunner. I'm scoring Springbank's 2021 Campbellton Maltz Festival bottling a 94. The independent bottler Caden Heads is part of the Springbank Distillers J&A Mitchell family, and while it did not release a specific Campbellton Maltz Festival bottling, Caden Heads did do a virtual warehouse tasting during the Campbellton Festival of several of its whiskeys available through the Caden Heads website. That included a single cask bottling from Sweden's High Coast Distillery, matured for seven years in a new American oak cask that had been filled with a blend of 90% unpeated spirit and 10% peated High Coast spirit. This one is bottled at 61.8% ABV. The nose is vibrant and tart, with tropical fruits, including grapefruit, mango, and papaya, hints of wood spice, honey, and vanilla. The taste is nectar-thick, fruity, and tart with tropical fruits, ginger, cinnamon, and touches of honey and vanilla in the background. And adding some water just boosts the fruity character even more. The finish is long and fruity with a hint of spice. And I'm scoring the Caden Heads High Coast 7-year-old single cask a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 3,200 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like... An Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. And before I get to your comments, I wanted to thank a couple of colleagues for having me as a guest on their podcasts in the last week or two. Greg Rempe invited me back on his Barbecue Central show the other night, to talk about whiskeys, and Knock Do distillery manager Gordon Bruce got to turn the tables on me for once and ask me the questions for the latest episode of a Knox Knock Tales podcast. You'll find them both wherever you get your podcasts. Now to your comments. Last time around, I mentioned Chris Koenig's criticism of our interview two weeks ago with Edward Slingerland the author of the new book, Drunk, How We Sipped, Danced, and Stumbled Our Way to Civilization. Chris is a distiller in California and views Slingerland as essentially a neo-prohibitionist for his view that distilled spirits should be taxed at a higher rate than beer or wine because he considers them more dangerous to society. We also included Slingerland's response last week, He doesn't view taxation as equal to prohibition and still enjoys whiskey and other spirits himself. Well, this week, Chris Koenig responded via email, and I'm quoting now, 
If Slingerland doesn't think taxes are a form of prohibition, he might watch the current U.S. Congress and how they're introducing legislation that would create a 30% tax on gun sales and a 50% tax on ammunition. Their goal is to suppress gun and ammo sales via higher taxes, with the hope that reduces gun violence. Regardless how you say it, these taxes would create a prohibition, even if it will only affect lower income brackets. Okay, I am going to pull the plug on this debate at this point. Chris, I see where you're coming from, but we are not going to get into the issue of gun control and gun violence here. I already have enough people accusing me of bringing politics into a whiskey podcast as it is. On a lighter, almost bubbly note, last time around I reported on the outcry over Russia's new law, decreeing that only sparkling wine made in Russia can be labeled there as champagne, or in Russian, champagneskoya. Longtime listener Ken Goldenberg in Orange County, California, sent this email. Hey, Mark, so as you were talking about Russia's new champagne law and the French reaction to it, I was turning on to Champagne Boulevard on my way to the Lawrence Welk Resort in Escondido, California. Larry and his champagne bubbles must be smiling down upon us. Well, that's great timing, Ken. And just an update, France's foreign trade minister has issued what's being called a strongly worded rebuke to Russian officials over the new law and threatened to take the issue to the World Trade Organization. Oh yeah, that's going to scare the borscht out of Vladimir Putin. And thanks to Pete, at Whiskey Ranked on Twitter, he shared a beautiful black-and-white photo this weekend with us, along with this note. Found this nice photo of three small drams when going through my photos. Can't remember what they are, though. Pete was submitting it for our Whiskey Photo of the Week, but I have to tell you that we've always reserved that for my photos, just because of the copyright issues involved with republishing the photos of others. However, it has been years since we had a listener photo contest, and Pete's tweet gives me the idea that it might just be about time to have another one. Watch this space. In the meantime, if there is something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, whether it's a photo, question, or suggestion, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Vermont's Whistle Pig Rye is coming out with a new beer cask finish whiskey, but there's just a little more to roadstock than being finished in beer casks. And given that we talked about distilling and maturing whiskey at altitude last month, it's worth looking at this one in a bit of detail. You see, Whistle Pig claims roadstock is the world's first ever finished on the road whiskey. And here's the backstory. They turned an 18-wheeler into a rolling rickhouse full of barrels for a road trip across the U.S. to Firestone Walker Brewery in central California. Half of those barrels were standard virgin oak, while the whiskey in the other half was refilled into barrels that had held Jordan Winery's Alexander Valley Bordeaux Red Wine Blend just before the trip. When the truck arrived in central California... The barrels were emptied, and the whiskey then filled into three different types of Firestone Walker beer barrels. Those barrels were then put back on the truck and driven to Vermont, where Whistle Pig blender Megan Ireland went to work on creating roadstock. Now, Whistle Pig is claiming that the whiskey in those barrels experienced, quote, wild temperature, elevation, and climate changes 
during that 6,000 or so miles of travel, with a claimed 55-degree temperature swing between Vermont and the desert southwest. But let's be honest. Realistically, it only takes a week to 10 days at most to drive across the U.S. and back in an 18-wheeler, even stopping for video and photo shoots along the way. Yes, the trailer was painted black on the sides at least, and yes, it did have temperature swings, but did that really make a difference? We don't really know since Whistlepig didn't disclose how long the trip actually took. And as for altitude, yes, there were elevation changes during the trip. But we know from the distillery's promotional video that the truck went through Arizona on its westward trip, going south around the Rocky Mountains and then up the California coast, skipping the most extreme altitude changes. We don't know about the trip back to Vermont, but once again looking at whiskey matured for years in the Rockies shows that there can be differences over time. And as for climate, the biggest change during the trip would have been humidity, since going through the desert would have meant much drier air, with a possible loss of more water during the days those barrels spent in the desert. But since the roadstock rye was bottled at 43% ABV, we would not be able to tell whether the whiskey gained a little bit of strength during that time in the desert. Yes, it's a good story, and full points to Whistlepig for trying something different. But as with a lot of stories around the whiskey world, sometimes it's best to think like a margarita drinker and take it with a bit of salt. If there's something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist, a unique triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of past episodes going all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. All right, let's talk about our whiskey collections. Dewar's 15-Year-Old Whiskey is a great addition, especially for those of you who like bourbon. Recently honored with a gold medal at the 2021 San Francisco World Spirits Competition, this 15-year-old has the hardware to go toe-to-toe with any bourbon. Find Dewar's 15-Year-Old online or in a store near you. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? (laughs) Always the same. Few too many... Tail feathers come out, drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.